The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, October 24th, 2022. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Raymond Crape, professor of history of Cornell University, author of Adventure Capitalism, A History of Libertarian Exit from the Era of Decolonization to the Digital Age. Also on the program today, early voting breaking records, though nobody knows really what that means. And sadly, not in Ohio's Democratic uh, counties. Meanwhile, Republican Super PAC abandons New Hampshire Don Bolduck. Bye bye, maybe. Uh, and hello, Rishi Sunak, to be England's new prime minister. You won't have Bojo to kick around anymore. <laughs> Thought he was going to come back. Not happening. It would have been fun. Would have been fun. Eighth Circuit. The nearly all Republican Eighth Circuit temporarily halts the Biden student debt relief program. You can still go online, sign up for it. They will process it. It just won't be releasing. They won't be relieving debt until this is resolved. Lindsey Graham wants the Supreme Court to block his subpoena from the Georgia grand jury looking into election interference there. Trump Inc., Their tax fraud trial starts today in New York City. Even if it's, even if the company is found guilty, only talking a couple of million dollars worth of a fine. And the Republicans unveil their national don't say gay bill, which they hope to pursue in the event that they win in these midterms. This and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It is uh, Monday. And uh, Emma, why don't you uh, remind everybody what, what, what Monday is? I don't even remember what... It's Fun Day. Fun Day it Monday. rhymes. Woo! All yeah. right. There we go. Mm-hmm. Yes. Monday, Fun Day. It's, uh, it's a very fun Monday when the Giants are 6-1. and one. <clears throat> Did I... Well, someone just said it, it's pronounced Colonel. Did I... What? Did I do something... I don't know what that means. Um, I don't know, but I perhaps, didn't, I maybe say? it's a joke. I don't know. All right. Um, it is Monday, uh, beginning of a new week. We are, of course, really uh, 15 days away mm. from the uh, midterm elections. I yeah, guess I like think two f- weeks out tomorrow. Yeah, 15, yeah, two weeks tomorrow. Yeah, 15 exactly. We should probably get on planning about what we're going to do <laughs> so, on that well, night. Yeah, I got to I got to make a big spreadsheet for all of our closing poll times and stuff. Okay. Well, uh, uh, we uh, either way, we're having a big mega stream. Yeah, we should say we can stream. we can tell people that, right? Yeah, we're um, uh, a we we uh, we. I, I mean, a mega stream. Like, what do you mean? I mean, we're, well, we're, it's like now we're not just doing our regular show at noon Eastern. We're going to be yeah. streaming throughout the night. Well, we're going to be doing it at night, but for it's not the election I mean, coverage. It's I, night. I mean, uh, yeah, it's going to be right. mega. I mean, uh, yeah, right. Totally. That was um. My, so we're coming up on two years of me working here. That was like my right. first week. Was our my first day was the Monday before election day, and then we did a mega stream, <laughs> which is what I'm going to call it now. Okay. Okay. You don't like that? No, I'm I'm all in favor of that. Um, uh, but but we did. But that's the point being is is it'll be fun. It's um. Those are always exciting nights. Election yeah, night. uh, mega yeah. streams. Yeah. Um. On Friday, <laughs> trying to sell it. Yep. 
on Friday, President Joe Biden um, was speaking at the White House in uh, what was ostensibly uh, to be an announcement about the reduction in the deficit. Um, some people are into that, I guess. Uh, but he used that opportunity to um, give his thoughts on the Republican Party's economic agenda. The, the, very little has been paid attention uh, or been made of this, at least on a national level. I don't know race to race if this is uh, being highlighted by candidates at all. Uh, but the Republicans have a plan to cut Social Security and Medicare. Um, and I, will they be able to pass it? Well, they, conceivably, they could pass it if they take over the House, they take over the Senate, but uh, it will be vetoed. But this is their agenda. Um, here's uh, Joe Biden. I have to admit, every once in a while they surprise me. They have three, not one, not two, three plans to cut Social Security benefits. Three plans. They're not going to stop there. They're going to do big farmers bidding to repeal my plan to allow Medicare to negotiate prescription drugs prices. We pay the highest in the world. And in doing so, it's going to raise drug prices. And they're going to raise big farmers' profits. They're doing fine, big farmers. They're not hurting at all. And they're going to raise your health insurance premiums. It's mega, mega trickle down. Mega, mega trickle down. The kind of policies hmm. that have failed the country before and will fail it again. And it'll mean more wealth to the very wealthy, higher inflation for the middle class. That's the choice we're facing. That's why I think that we're going to do just fine. You know, I was going to vote for it, and then he called it Mega Maga, and I'm like, no way am I doing that. He was selling it so well up until that point, and then the, he had to, and you could see he's tripping over it, right? It's not natural for him to bring out the six months of poll-tested uh, phrase of Mega Maga. That's why I had Mega on the brain, by the way. I see. Mega Maga stream, right? I mean, <laughs> damn it, Mega Maga, whatever the hell, Mega Maga trickle down. I mean, that's just completely, ima that is not a good communication. Yeah, it's uh, it's 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 bizarre, and um, but you know the the, the point about uh, Social Security helpful. Uh, I think you know, I think all the networks carried at least that speech. I think I don't know if they covered it live, all of them. But it's it is good to get somebody out there to talk about how uh, Republicans are coming from your Social Security. That seems to be their only plan that they ever have. Uh, but why not call them Republicans instead of mega maga? It is Republican trickle down. That's it. And I also think the most effective usually is like, and we'll, we'll get to, we can get to a clip later when he does this exact rhetorical maneuver is like naming names and associating yes. them with the policy. Like name the people who are actually right. in support of this. Say over and over, Kevin McCarthy wants this. Kevin McCarthy wants this. Rick Scott wants this. Rick Scott wants this. Like, I don't understand. It's also not, it's not even easy to say aesthetically. It's when like you, a tongue twister. He also you, you, could talk about the someone like Ron Johnson as well, who's yeah. directly in a contested election coming up. We we saw that um, uh, that Pennsylvania focused uh, group. I don't know if you were here that day. We watched the, some of the video of that. We did. And, yeah, I was here. And the idea that these voters were savvy to the notion that if they vote for a Republican, they're empowering. They're not just voting for that one individual. They're empowering the Republican Party and the Republican agenda. And that's what he's got to do. When you vote for a Republican House member, when you vote for a Republican senator, you are voting for Kevin McCarthy's cut Social Security plans. You are voting for Rick Scott's cut Social however it is in that way. When you vote for Ron Johnson, you're voting for Rick Scott's um, uh, plan to cut Social Security. That's that's seems to me uh, the way to, to to close that loop, because who's coming out there and going like, well, I'm a mega MAGA uh, candidate. Nobody. I mean, who, who is he talking about? It's so muddied, like who he's even identifying as opposed to, as Bradley said, just name names. And yep. and 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 his his instinct is right there to start hitting them on the Social Security element. But then you just trip over yourself. I don't know. Uh, folks, uh, got a couple of sponsors and then, uh, we will be uh, talking to Raymond Crabe, his professor of history at Cornell university, author of adventure capitalism, a history of libertarian exit from the era of decolonization, uh, to the digital age. Um, 
Do you remember the last time you had two uh, nights of uh, of good sleep? No. I don't either. Uh, but th- this stuff will help you. Um, cozy earth sheets. I mean, if it wasn't for my kids disturbing my speed and my, my sleep uh, on both ends, frankly, um, my cozy earth sheets would work better. But at least they feel comfortable. Right. And, and the big thing for me, heat regulation. That is my, um, that is my, my, that is, th- that was the bane of my existence before these sheets. It was like, you get too, you get too hot. I don't know. That's for me. That was a big no, problem. No, same here. Yeah. Uh, Cozy Earth was created to enhance people's lives by offering the softest, most luxurious, and environmentally friendly bedding in the world. They have over 5,000 five-star reviews. Uh, they are made, Cozy Earth sheets are made from what they call, I guess, viscose, which is from bamboo. It's 100% viscose. Uh, they are super soft. They are lightweight. And they are temperature regulating. Cozy Earth bamboo sheets are now available in four natural colors. And they even come packaged in a stylish, reusable Cozy Earth tote. Hmm. Who, who couldn't use an extra tote? Uh, it doesn't matter uh, whether it's their best-selling luxury sheets, their ultra-comfortable loungewear collection. We've got a bunch. Of, I've never tried their, the, the, the loungewear because I don't, I don't lounge. That's not, right. that's not my... I, I have no opportunity to lounge at any point. But we got, I don't know if it was IM or an email last time, talking about uh, they got the loungewear and they love it. They also have a new bath collection. You're going to love shopping at Cozy Earth. Get Cozy now. My audience can save 35% on Cozy Earth. Go to CozyEarth.com slash majority. Save 35%. This is all backed by a 100-night sleep guarantee. That's CozyEarth.com slash majority cozyearth.com slash majority we will put a link in our youtube and podcast description and as you know midterm elections are here 435 seats in the house uh in the house 35 seats in the senate up for grabs we hope those seats will be filled (laughs) by people with qualify who are qualified right yeah if only if only we could use zip recruiter to weed them out (laughs) What did you think? No, the, I don't I thought, know what you were I thought thinking. Something else was okay. happening. <laughs> um, uh, uh, ZipRecruiter is uh, the easiest and and frank, frankly most effective way to hire. Why? Because ZipRecruiter does the work for you. Right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com/majority. I have always said the best time to look for new hires is when you don't need them. You don't want to get caught surprised. It's good to go in, see what's out there, work out the, the, the system. You will check it out. Super easy to use. And uh, the thing with ZipRecruiter, it uses its technology to find and match the right candidates up with your job and then sends them to you. You can easily review these recommended candidates and invite your top choices to apply. And then you can organize them in their user interface Decide which ones you're going to interview. A uh, really great system. I've used it in the past hmm. to great results. If you want a better way to find great people for your team, try ZipRecruiter for free right now at this special URL, ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. Once again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash majority, M-A-J-O-R-I-T-Y. Then elect to take some time for you because you've got ZipRecruiter to help. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. That, of course, we'll put in the YouTube and podcast description. And as always, um, you can get the free show free of commercials by becoming a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. You will help the show survive and thrive, and then you get the fun half. Okay, quick break. When we come back, Raymond Craig, professor of history at Cornell University, author of Adventure Capitalism, A History of Libertarian Exit.
We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. It's a welcome, uh, want to welcome to the program Raymond Crabe. He is the professor of history at Cornell University, author of Adventure Capitalism, A History of Libertarian Exit from the Era of Decolonization to the Digital Age. Uh, uh, Raymond, welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much for having me. Glad to be here. Um, I've, had, I've talked to a lot of libertarians on this program <laughs> over, the, over the past, well, 10 15 years, I guess, um, never had a single libertarian who acknowledged the libertarianness of any previous libertarian callers or guests I've had on this program, <laughs> um, regardless of whether they are the chairman of the Libertarian Party or, you know, uh, Walter Block, uh, an advisor to, 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 to Ron Paul, or just they, they all think the other libertarians are wrong. Um, give us... Uh, let's just set, I mean, because this is a story of basically like a lot of people sort of go and galt uh, or hoping to in some way. But give us, uh, let's just back up a little bit and, and, and tell us the ideological strains that are involved in this, because you have a specific notion of like American libertarians. L let's just take it from Mount, Mount Pelerin, as it were. And you've got, uh, you know, uh, 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 Mises and uh, Hayek coming out of there. Uh, and then and then where are we from there? Yeah, I mean, you know, I use a kind of big tent definition of libertarian in the book. Uh, and so, you know, folks like Hayek and Friedman, I see it kind of one end of this libertarian spectrum that we would more commonly maybe associate with neoliberalism. Uh, and then at the other end of the spectrum, you could situate somebody at least for the 1960s and 1970s like Murray Rothbard, uh, much more dogmatic about everything being run through contractual relations, uh, even national defense uh, and so forth. And then sort of in the middle, uh, you have these you know, figures like uh, von Mises, but also someone like Ayn Rand, who's just so incredibly influential amongst the, at least the individuals I look at, uh, both in the 1960s and 1970s, but also now amongst the, the kind of tech utopian uh, libertarians that I look at. Uh, as well. So I use this kind of broad uh, spectrum to kind of think about libertarianism in the U.S., also, you know, the U.K., um, and certainly <laughs> recent events in the U.K. Uh, give us a sense of this libertarian tradition uh, coming home to roost uh, in other parts of the, of the Commonwealth. So it is a kind of Austrian school, uh, but also a sort of Anglo school that I'm looking at. Yeah. Can you just for the sake of just uh, for can you just also all right? So we've got that spectrum in terms of personalities, yeah. but for the sake of people who don't know, like the you know uh, Friedman's a little bit more statist, and yeah. and when you say neoliberal, we're talking like neoliberal in the actual academic definition of of uh, of of these types wanting the state to basically help a particular industry or players within the context of an industry as they set this up. So will you just like from yeah. an idea, just, uh, just go just slightly uh, deeper into these ideological strains a as we move forward, that are all part of like, you know, this, this broad umbrella. Yeah. I mean, I think all, all of these are individuals in some sense who uh, think that the, the market should be sovereign and that states should exist, but states should exist to help the market be sovereign rather than states being sovereign and markets existing within them. And so people like Friedman and, uh, and Hayek uh, made room for certain kind of aspects of the state. They were against central planning. There were lots of aspects of the New Deal and the welfare state or the so-called welfare regulatory state that they didn't like. But they also made room for certain kinds of things that they recognized were necessary if states were going to survive things like the Great Depression or war and so on and so forth. Uh, you have then this kind of middle range folks that I talked about, like Ayn Rand and, and someone like von Mises, um, here you have individuals who are ardently arguing uh, for even a more stripped down space for the state. The state should only exist to protect people, individuals from violence, direct physical violence. So they don't really talk about structural violence, the, the violence of uh, being impoverished, of being exploited in the workplace and so on and so forth, but direct violence. They talk about uh, only having a police force for that reason 
uh, a military for national defense, and then you need a judiciary and a patent office and so forth to protect people from fraud and breach of contract. So they talk about and argue very strongly for what they call a minimalist or ultra minimalist state. But the point of that is that minimalism means minimalist in the range of its functions, not in the size of its budget or the size of the state apparatus. They really want it to be limited in terms of what it does to be directly related to protecting individuals who are involved in market transactions, contractual relationships, and so forth uh, from fraud and violence. Um, so hopefully that kind of help gives you a, a sense of this. Rothbard, of course, is um, even more adamant about everything being run through uh, kind of private contract, so privatized military, privatized police force, and so forth, at least until he, he allies himself with uh, um, people like Pat Buchanan and others in the 1980s. And we should say like uh, Rothbardian is the closest to maybe like what people sometimes refer to themselves as like an ANCAP or uh, right. uh, an anarcho-capitalist, which is, right. you know, that's what yes. they like to call themselves. <laughs> yes. um, but, uh, and, and so, um, and we should say also across the board, just the last question on this sort of like a, a ideological level, um, how much do they recognize the need for a state to precede the existence of, of the market? <laughs> yes. Um, so that's a good question because uh, they're always a little bit fuzzy around this in certain ways. Um, and there's always a kind of um, unwillingness, let's say, let's put it this way, to recognize uh, or to wrestle with the reality of the violent forms of expropriation that they oppose that actually lay the groundwork for their own wealth and well-being. And so you can think of um, the violent expropriation of native peoples in the Americas through forms of colonization. You can think of the expulsion of, uh, commoners from their lands, uh, in England and the highlands of Scotland, um, and the sort of enclosure of lands that took place there, forcing people into uh, wage work and the like. Uh, but that's sort of what Marx, Karl Marx called the blood and fire of primitive accumulation. That is, uh, actually something that doesn't get adequately addressed in a lot of their writing, including, I might add, in, in one of the more sophisticated defenses of the sort of ultra minimalist state argument, and that's Anarchy, State and Utopia, Robert Nozick's 1974 um, philosophical rebuttal uh, to, to some of the other philosophical work defending, um, defending sort of uh, liberal um, uh, ideas of liberal justice uh, and equality in the work of people like John Rawls. And Newton, so Nozick even tries to sort of wrestle with this, but not uh, doesn't do particularly well. And I think part of the issue here is this is an inability to sort of put the square peg of violent expropriation and dispossession into this round hole of private property rights. But part of it is like if they acknowledge that you need the state for the market, to exist in any real manner, it begin they it opens up the door to things like uh, asymmetrical information or right. power within the the marketplace, and where does a government land on this? And then they have to start to concede that there's always winners and losers, and that's just a choice that we make as a society. But the yeah. the and, and so let's move into the the first era of like of what you call. Uh, libertarian exit. It also is, <clears throat> in some respects, uh, libertarian entrance um, <laughs> and uh, into to other spaces. Um, I, I in in like I I had a conversation with Walter Block. I had multiple ones with him, but at one point he was explaining to me that, uh, and I said, at what point should we recognize property rights? Like there were people here. Uh, who were on this land when we came. And he basically said, right after we take it, yeah, right. right after we take it is when we should, we should recognize the, mm. the, the, uh, the, that property rights are paramount because we came over with a French philosophy about working the land. And mm -hmm. that's when we should start to count. The cl that's when the clock starts. Um, right. the, the, so much of this seems to be like the same mentality, particularly in the first sort of like era 
uh, of the 60s and 70s when decolonization is happening, you write about uh, this guy, uh, Michael Oliver, mm -hmm. and uh, like three attempts he had to I, to exit, but really to enter. Well, let's mm -hmm. start with, with the first, which is um, what he called the Island of Minerva. Uh, right. uh, tell us about that. Yeah, you know, Oliver, um, Oliver's an interesting person. He was born Moses Alitsky in, in Lithuania, and he was the only family, uh, the only member of his family to, to survive the Holocaust. And he came to the States in the late 1940s and moved to Nevada. And, uh, you know, he got involved in land development and also owned a, a, a coin a dealership. And so he was interested in sort of metals and things like this. And, you know, in the late 1960s, he, he had done fairly well for himself and, and also was very concerned about the ways in which things were looking politically in the United States and felt that there needed to be an option to create a new country. This is what he calls it, a, a new country. And so the first place he looked, I mean, he looked at a lot of places, kind of explored them. Uh, but the first place where he tried to actually do this was on a, a an atoll a reef, it's the majority of time out of the day, it's underwater, it's the Minerva Reef. And this is south of the archipelago of Tonga in the Pacific Southwest. So if you think of New Zealand and look north of New Zealand, you'll find the Minerva Reefs. And the premise here was essentially uh, that this was one place where if somebody wanted to start a new country, they would be able to do so because sovereignty, there was no sovereignty over the atoll, at least as he understood it and as the lawyers that he had hired uh, suggested to him. Um, the problem, I mean, they, you know, they went through a whole series of things. They dredged sand out of the lagoon. They piled it on top of the reef. They wanted to put coral inside of chicken wire and fill it with concrete and develop a giant platform that would eventually house up to 30,000 people. Um, it didn't really uh, end up going anywhere because the king of Tonga uh, found out about this. But this is where it gets interesting because the Minerva reefs weren't exactly under the jurisdiction uh, of Tonga at the time either. But what is clear is that that doesn't mean the reefs were themselves open for the taking. And I think this is exactly what you're suggesting, this idea that there are just these places that are just there that are described maybe ambiguously in legal literature or thought of as a commons or a thought of as open for taking. People talk about the open ocean and the high seas. And it just wasn't the case. Um, and these were areas where uh, fisher, fishermen from Tonga, fishermen from Fiji and elsewhere would fish and lobster and crab there. These were places where, in fact, a number of Tongans were buried in the reef after uh, a shipwreck in 1962. So these are places that actually have meaning, uh, economic meaning, uh, cultural meaning and so forth to populations in the area. And so to collectively, actually, the archipelagos in the South and the Pacific Southwest uh, adamantly opposed these projects by Michael Oliver and his backers and collectively supported suggesting that these reefs were under the general jurisdiction at the time um, of the archipelago of Tonga. Um, before we talk about the, the next attempt to enter, and this is even <laughs> more of an entering, it seems to me. Um, yes. in, uh, in the Bahamas, describe like what, how he, how Oliver perceived this in terms of like, he, he was trying to create a utopia as opposed to escaping, let's say, I don't, you know, uh, uh having to pay taxes. Like, I mean, this was a, a very, uh, um, I mean, he was, he was sincere about this, uh, yes. but it went, <laughs> In practice, it starts to become uh, like a little bit. Um, his sincerity only really applied to what he was do or would do in the future, as opposed to what he was doing in the present tense. It sort of feels like. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, you know, Oliver's a he's an interesting character, uh, an interesting person. You know, I did speak with him uh, at a certain moment and he told me he would never want to, he wasn't trying to create a utopia is how he put it to me. Uh, in retrospect, he, he thought he was just trying to suggest that there were better forms of governance as compared to the ones that were existing at the time. Um, but you're right. He, it wasn't just about escaping taxes or, or regulations or things like this. He saw this as what he called a moral experiment. This is how he, he termed it. And, um, 
so he saw this as as something that was uh, actually essential to uh, finding better forms of human freedom on the sort of individual uh, level. And so when he uh, engaged in these uh, kinds of activities, I think there was a certain level uh, of unwillingness uh, to see the consequences or to recognize uh, the possible implications of the kinds of things that they were undertaking. He had backers, I think, who shared a lot of his kinds of perspectives, very wealthy backers in the United States and in the United Kingdom. Um, Willard Garvey, who was a wet, uh, a wheat magnate, uh, John Templeton, uh, who was a Wall Street investor. These were people with intensive amounts of resources, and they funded him uh, substantially uh, in their hopes that they would also see something like this come to um, fruition. So I think with this kind of energy around him and the, the sort of moment of the late 1960s, it was a moment in which the there was a, a, a it was easy to have a set of blinders on, I guess, is one way to, uh, to put it, and to not see or question the implications uh, of what these projects meant for people who were attempting to throw off colonial rule. Well, it's also just, I think, a, a, a good example to see how the like you write about how there was some sort of adoption of anti-war rhetoric during this time period by some yeah. libertarian types or what we've come to know as libertarians. And so but but that's not does not come out of any uh, anti-domination kind of politics or anti-colonial politics like it would from from the left um, mm -hmm. that the, it came out of, you know, uh, reducing the power of the state. And that's instructive into seeing like how Mike Lee now currently talks about being anti-war when it's not actually based in anti-war principles. Yes, exactly. And, and this is, you know, it is very much the, the sort of anti-war rhetoric uh, is it, in, in most of the cases that I look at when there are these moments of anti-war rhetoric, you're exactly right. This is a question about uh, the, the power or behavior of the state, but there's never any question about the power or the behavior of capital right? mm. or their own behavior vis-a-vis uh, -vis the places where they begin to intervene. Yes. It, it, I, I mean, it feels like uh, he, Oliver went from Abaco, it, 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 which is, a, I guess, an island, that, a part of the Bahamas, uh, where he was hoping for basically, I guess, to stoke some type of secessionist movement, I guess. <laughs> yes. I, I, don't, I mean, I don't know how else to describe it. To mm -hmm. to his, when that failed, he goes to what is now known as Vanatu, uh, then I guess New Hebrides, um, and like full on, like just sort of steps it up a little bit. Like it's almost like you're getting a little bit more uh, desperate. And this is really like, this is, um, it, it, it is, a weird sort of counter decolonization movement that he's starting. Like we're going to be insurrectionists, but it's really not going to be anybody who is there already for the most mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it, it does get, it does get stranger as the seventies unfold. I mean, after the Minerva project folds, as you, as you mentioned, he goes to Abaco, uh, which are, these are two, islands in the archipelago of the Bahamas. And, and you know, his allies in that are quite um, yeah, quite interesting, to say the least. I mean, you have a, an old OSS uh, guy who's building silencers for some of the deadliest weapons in the world, Mitchell Livingston Werbel III. You have ex-CIA agents who were involved in the Phoenix program in Vietnam. Uh, you have Harry Schultz, who was an investment specialist. Uh, Margaret Thatcher was one of his readers of his newsletter. You have an array of these kinds of individuals, and they're looking to, to help uh, this kind of secessionist movement or, or independence movement on, on Abaco. And then the same kind of process, because the Bahamas was going to become independent in 1973. And so Abaco was looking to break away from the Bahamas. There were you know people who didn't want to um, see their... Uh, community controlled by a predominantly black government. There's, so there's racist politics involved here. There's also sort of anti-communist politics involved and anti, uh, anti-decolonial politics. And then he goes, you're right. He goes to the new Hebrides and, and here he allies himself again with, uh, a movement that is looking at the possibility of secession. Uh, and, and there is a kind of recolonizing component to this. I mean, this is the thing that always, uh, strikes me as, um, uh, 
as I don't want to say peculiar, but a, the kind of tone deafness to uh, the, the new forms of kind of colonialism that are unfolding when they undertake these projects. And many in, in the New Hebrides at the time understood this. They talked very clearly and very directly about these projects as being a kind of new wave of colonization, just a different kind of colonization. How, how does, how did Oliver, when you, when you, you talked to him, how did he sort of reconcile the idea of a moral experiment with like, we just need to do one vaguely immoral thing first, and then we're going to be moral. I mean, is that basically what it comes down to? Or I think he, you know, I, my conversations with him, I mean, it was, it was difficult. These are projects he didn't really like to talk about very much, uh, but he did, especially in the case of the new Hebrides, uh, you know, he had, uh, a, a group of people that he did collaborate with who were supportive of him, who saw in him the best opportunity for them to create a certain kind of post-colonial, you know, after colonialism uh, reality for themselves where they wouldn't come under the control of, of others on the archipelago who they, they saw themselves to some degree in competition with. I mean, the interesting thing is that, you know, he, I don't think he ever saw it as a kind of immoral project, uh, but rather a project that um, was misunderstood uh, and um, and never quite given the opportunity to succeed. Of course, the fact of the matter is that on the ground, there, there were many people who didn't want to see these things succeed for very understandable reasons. I went to Vanuatu to do research in 2017, and um, he he is very strongly remembered there. Everybody remembers the name of Michael Oliver, and they either revere him or revile him. There's no sort of in-between ground. But there are quite a few people in Vanuatu who actually um, have a have a kind of uh, positive uh, memory of him. It's quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, let's move into the to the digital age because it sort of feels yeah. like um, the, uh, you know, round two, uh, this is sort of more, uh, uh, I guess it's uh, reader, really uh, Peter Thiel and Paul Rohner uh, the, it, it almost feels like they understood the sort of moral, um, uh, the things that were like morally problematic with sort of like recolonizing. And so they tried to find, like, make new space in some way. Yeah. I mean, you know, I look at two projects, Seasteading, uh, the Seasteading Institute, which which you mentioned Peter Thiel. He was the kind of angel investor for, for that. And then it was uh, directed by by Milton Friedman's grandson, Patrick Friedman. Um, and yeah, this was a kind of, you know, create new space, find new space. Uh, and that would be, again, the ocean, the high seas and the idea of creating these sort of private sovereign platforms that would float in uh, on the high seas and you could sort of combine and disconnect as you saw fit as you tried to build communities. Um, again, you have the longstanding issues of you know, engineering questions, legal questions about the status of the high seas. But I think the big problem is labor costs. I mean, it's much more fundamental. It's just the labor costs. If you're that far out uh, from from any metropolitan center, any area where you can get labor. But they were looking to kind of find a new space. The, the case of Paul Romer and the Charter Cities idea, which he tried out first in Madagascar in 2008 and then in Honduras after a coup d'etat, uh, he started there in 2009. That, to me, smacks much more of kind of classic colonization. Um, it's a real effort to essentially persuade an illegal coup uh, government to cede sovereign territory of Honduras to a group of kind of international investors and oversight boards uh, so that they can create a nostalgic version of Hong Kong. Yeah. We, we walk us through how that was supposed to work. It, it, it sort of yeah. reminds me a little bit of like, like school choice, like charters, like charter school. I mean, honestly, it's sort of the same uh, dynamic. Like we're just right. going to extract um the resources from what society should own. And in this instance, they're just, they're just, you know, they're just buying it. And, uh, right. and then, it, but, but walk us through how that was supposed to work. Yeah. So there's two phases to this. The first phase is charter, the sort of charter cities idea, which was Paul Romer's idea. And then it morphs into something that, that is commonly referred to as free private cities. The charter city idea of Romer's was basically, look, 
uh, traditional forms of development and aid uh, haven't worked very well. What we need to do is in places that are struggling, set up uh, a kind of uh, sovereign uh, territory, city, something like this, industrial zone, free trade zone, uh, and actually have it managed by a kind of oversight board and a, a, a sort of, you know, kind of collective international oversight board of either national governments or investors and so on and so forth. And essentially in these places, the if we take the case of Honduras, the Honduran constitution wouldn't apply. This uh, space would have its own police force. It would have its own judiciary uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, ideally, according to Romer, charter cities of this kind would be opt in, opt out. You can choose to go there or not go there, but you don't vote. You don't make any decisions, but you either abide by the terms of the contract of living there or you don't. Um, this is, of course, very idealized because there had to be some kind of migrant. He himself admitted there would have to be some kind of migratory control. So it wasn't perfectly open, opt in or opt out. Um, but, it, you know, it had this kind of idea about special economic zones and Hong Kong and so forth. Very optimistic about those things, which I think is also problematic. The big issue for Romer was that uh, he was working with a, a, a coup d'etat government uh, that was uh, pretty corrupt and kind of nepotistic and, and so on and so forth. And very quickly, there was competition for uh, these kinds of spaces. And so you see uh, both former officials from the Reagan administration uh, and people like Grover Norquist, the famous anti-tax pledge guy, uh, and, and various people who worked in Reagan's administration in the Office of Central American Affairs, you see them very quickly descending on Honduras, wanting a piece of the action, as well as various uh, sort of, again, tech libertarians from Silicon Valley. Patrick Friedman created a, a company called uh, Future Cities Incorporated that was trying to get on the action. There was others involved, right? And what they wanted to do was something a little more beyond charter cities. They wanted what they call free private cities, which would not necessarily be opt-in or opt-out. They would be buy-in, uh, essentially. You had to have the money to buy into them, and they would be uh, kind of private-gated communities or private-gated cities, uh, but with, again, their own judiciary, their own uh, legal system, their own police force, uh, and so on and so forth. That, that version almost makes at least more sense. It's just like a, it's a uh, private community. It's a gated community, essentially, right? I mean, a gated community will have their own uh, security force and they'll have their, you know, uh, board of, uh, uh, you know, I guess of like uh, the co-op board or whatever right. it is. But it, it's, it's, it's hilarious uh, on some level that he was uh, thwarted by what he wanted to create in the first place right like it's just the market forces came in and outbid him on some level right. yes but, uh, um but what how did in the non-private city right which is again like a gated community like here's my fee this right. is going to fund everything here and i pay this on a monthly basis my you know whatever it is co-op dues or condo association dues or whatever it is how is it supposed to work in the other which is of course not a tax uh, what, uh, what happens in the, like, did, did in the, uh, the charter cities with those also, like, how do they fund this stuff with, I mean, can they, if they're collecting taxes, really the only difference between their society ultimately is just like, it's just, we're just privately run. That's it. Like we're just, we, we're dictatorship. It's, it's, it's feudalism again. Right. I mean, isn't that what this is? I, I think that's right. I mean, the you know, it's not surprising that there's the language of neo feudalism and neo reactionary, uh, the idea of neo reaction kind of floating around on the periphery of all of this stuff. I mean, you have various uh, intellectuals associated with this. Uh, Hans Hermann Hope, uh, German American anarcho capitalist, uh, Nick Land, uh, and others. Curtis Yarvin, who also goes by the name of Mencius Moldbug. You have you have individuals who are sort of you know. Uh, connected up with the, the sort of digital side of this, the cryptocurrency side of this. And they use the language of feudalism and neo-feudalism and monarchy versus democracy. I mean, Thiel very famously said, uh, democracy and freedom are not compatible. 
And so it's exactly right. These are private state entities. You do not have a vote. The one difference, by the way, the common interest development reference that you made is actually is absolutely right. With one exception, the, the, the communities in Honduras, they would be, you know, a form of timeshare sovereignty, I think is one way to put it. But uh, the issue here is that none of the uh, articles of the Honduran constitution would apply. So that's the that's the kind of difference is they, they would have their own sort of constitutional charter. And even if in the future, for example, just to give you a, a, an example here, if the Honduran population were to vote and to vote against the existence of these entities, that vote would not apply. Right. So that's the kind of that's the little bit of a difference. But you're, you're right. They're very they very much resemble. Uh, you know, sort of homeowner associations, common interest developments, and so forth. You pay your fees, and you know, you have your boards, and so forth. Yeah. Is it uh, was was were the charter cities also? You got to pay fees. Uh, uh, you know, they would never call them taxes. But it's, <laughs> they wouldn't call fees. them taxes. Right. Yeah, you had various. You know, they had various kinds of. I mean, it never really got too far beyond the drawing board. I mean, this was the problem for Romer because he tried it in Madagascar and there was a coup d'etat in Madagascar, which brought it to an end very quickly. And then once he got to Honduras, there was a couple of things that had to happen. The Honduran constitution had to be changed. There was a struggle uh, over that and, and a number of Supreme Court justices were forcibly removed in order to ensure that the charter city idea uh, could move forward. But yes, the idea behind this was there would be certain kinds of fees that they wouldn't call taxes uh, certain kinds of investment um, uh, designs set up to attract investment. It was very much, uh, you know, sort of anti-labor, uh, anti-collective uh, bargaining. It was going to have all the kinds of things in place that you could associate with um, the sort of worse aspects of special economic zones. Did, did um, uh, were, were both like uh, both these I guess categories of projects, right? Uh, with, were they both also considered moral experiments i mean were they were they there to was the ends like this is going to be an example of how let's say america should be run uh on some level or was it like i'm gonna move there and make even more money because uh and and live just you know like a free like a free man uh mm -hmm. in this gated community <laughs> like what was the what was the point of yeah. it? You know, I think Romer, uh, I think he can be accused of being naive. Uh, I, I'm not sure I would put him down in the kind of uh, uh, category of, um, uh, of a sort of kind of nefarious uh, project here. I think he was naive about, I think he honestly felt there was something, uh, a kind of moral experiment here. And he ended up withdrawing in 2014. He, you know, he has this, point where he just says, this is not the kind of place where I'd want my children or grandchildren to live. And so I'm not doing this anymore and, 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 and so forth. Um, for others, I think the, you know, one of the things that you see in the language of both the seasteaders and uh, of folks involved in these projects in Honduras is this idea that what they create is in fact going to then have a rebound effect onto existing nation states and shape the ways in which they go forward in terms of things like regulation, taxation systems, so on and so forth. And so there's a lot, there's a kind of Promethean, you know, uh, uh, sensibility here where they think they're going to shape uh, other places in the world and kind of restructure nation state sovereignty writ large, because they're going to model, you know, how you can succeed uh, with these kinds of free private uh, cities, which of course have not succeeded. Are they like, <clears throat> I mean, I don't, I, I, off the top of my head, I don't remember how many billions Peter Thiel has at this point, but aren't they, aren't guys like him? Like, I mean, it seems to me like, I don't know how much land he's bought in New Zealand, but mm -hmm. if it sort of feels like you could go in and he could buy, he could buy a small country's worth of land in New Zealand, it seems to me, um, and set this up or alternatively, it feels like he's got um, he's got enough money that could rival like the GDP of a small country. Like, wh when are they going to come in and just what they wanted to do with a city? When are they going to do this with a country? 
Mm. I mean, could yeah, they yeah. conceivably like, yeah. or at least attempt to? It's like when billionaires buy small islands, but they could actually do it with, but, but on a more you know international scale, right? <laughs> Well, I think the 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 question here for them, and Michael Oliver had the same question, right? He found out very quickly that he could buy territory, he could buy property, his investors could support him in doing so. But what they couldn't buy is sovereignty. What they couldn't mm-hmm. buy is this, and this is the this is the kind of uh, wall that they constantly confront. So I'll just give you another example here that's quite interesting, and that's Balaji Srinivasan. Um, who just wrote a book uh, called The Network State. And he's been talking about this for some years. Uh, and he's a big advocate of the kinds of things that, that Teal and others uh, are talking about. But his idea was cloud first, create cloud communities first, digital sort of relationships and friendships, and then find territory to essentially uh, uh, kind of root or ground your community. It all sounds very new and innovative and flashy and and so on and so forth, but it's the same issue when you get down to it. Once you start talking about grounding this and getting out of the cloud and out of sort of the digital universe, where are you going to ground it and how are you going to do so? And they're going to run into the same um, issues. And so I think ultimately, right, the only uh, when you think about you know Peter Thiel buying up large land and 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 uh, and so forth, the only way those any of those ever sort of translate into some kind of sovereign entities is essentially through sort of colonial warfare. Or I guess maybe they go in and buy like um, uh, a, a native uh, reservation in this country. Like mm-hmm. I, I don't know if they could do that, but it it seems like you buy a place that's already outside of the sovereignty to to sort of run this little experiment but i just don't like at the end of the day they're just making a a gated community that mm-hmm. is uh not subject that the, the to i guess yeah i guess to outside to outside laws so really they're just escaping minimum wage requirements like i don't know what else they're not going to set up there um but they already what's amazing to me is just i guess the uh, the the depths of the greed because we already have the the capacity for tycoons like this to hide their money overseas and there's a whole pro publica article about how peter Thiel has essentially gamed the system when it comes to his roth ira and has Mm -hmm. made just billions and billions of dollars just stored in that and mm-hmm. it's like you already have your libertarian utopia for yourself. It's just in your bank account. Take a look, right? Like I don't even know what the what 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 the experiment would do if they're all individuals. Hey, you figured it out. You have billions of dollars. Like what is the end game for this? Yeah, I think that's a very good question because you're absolutely right. I mean, the the ability to socially secede is available now in a way that's unbelievable, right? And and these are many of these individuals have already demonstrated that that's very much the case. They can they can socially secede and withdraw, and they don't have to undertake projects like this. Um, the fact that they continue to do so, I think, is in part driven by uh, a desire to kind of prove, you know, uh, some kind of. Uh, Robinson Crusoe uh, sort of idealism uh, about the market and the individual combined with, you know, a sort of uh, hipster idea about Burning Man as it applies to governance or something. I mean, it's a very kind of mixed uh, sort of thing that they're generating and they want it, it's a it, it's ego driven. Right. I mean, that's why I called it Promethean earlier, because it is um, in at some level. Uh, a desire to uh, prove the market uh, superior, right? In terms of, and they talk about governance services. That's the way they'll sort of phrase, they won't talk about the state, they'll talk about governance services. But they'll also admit very quickly that um, something like the projects in Honduras, uh, sooner or later, uh, if they don't go forward in the way that they want them to go forward, are essentially going to be, as you put it, Sam, a country club, right? They're going to be a country club or a sort of gated community just in somebody else's uh country and then and then it's like they're still it's still you're gonna have to negotiate with honduras or the other country clubs there right and then all of a sudden you're starting to build some other superstructure that is no longer in your control in terms of the laws because 
Yeah, I mean, we're we're in, you know, gated community number one, but gated community number two doesn't agree with us. So all of a sudden you've just created a, uh, you're going to have to, at one point, if you're going to like in any way trade or, yeah. uh, uh, you know, right. how are we getting, you know, unless it's all satellite, I guess. Uh, but if we're going to get any sort of like, I don't know how we're going to get power here unless we create our own power station, like you're going to at one point have to deal with other people and they're not necessarily going to abide by the way that you're doing it. And then all of a sudden it's like, uh, Walter Block explained to me, he's got his court and I've got my court. And then our two courts hire a third court, presumably to resolve our courts differences. Um, and it's, it's, it's just amazing to me that like people can go that far down the road and, 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 they're just going to bump up into like, oh, we can't escape the fact that there are other human beings on the planet. That's right. I mean, they're, they're, these are not going to be autarkic communities. They're simply not. They're going to have to trade uh, and interrelate with and interact with uh, other communities no matter what. I mean, one of the things that's very difficult is, is you know, trying to take them seriously and trying to kind of make sense of them and not just seeing this as a grift. But once you start to go through the progression that you just went through, the logical progression, it's hard not to reach the conclusion that in many instances, that's what these are. These are real estate grifts. These are speculative ventures, just like any other real estate speculative venture, but gussied up with a certain kind of, um, you know, high profile, uh, ideological uh, uh, sort of photograph, right? I mean, it's 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 got this... Um, uh, wall that it always runs up against uh in some form that you just can't get beyond and logically it's like uh, it's like celebration like that disney town but without any of the fun stuff yeah but but <laughs> but speaking of speculative grift like what do you think the role of crypto has been in this these kinds of libertarian <laughs> utopias uh yeah. because that that's been there the the at the forefront of the at least branding of this kind of project yeah yeah, I mean, it's it's clearly uh, it, it's clearly embedded in a lot of these. I mean, the the so-called Portopians, right? The the sort of libertarian exiters who showed up in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. Brock Pierce is probably the most prominent of these, um, and I think Pierce, if I'm not mistaken, had a gaming company that Steve Bannon at some point was the, the sort of oh, director that's the of. Guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was in, he, he was a child star in in mighty ducks one and two uh and then sort of disappeared completely underrated him. incident <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh but but an early investor in bitcoin and and then did other stuff but he showed up in puerto rico after hurricane maria of course you got el salvador the president of el salvador who declared bitcoin a, a national currency um anybody who's seen the hbo miniseries the anarchists this is really about anarcho-capitalists it's not about anarchists at all um you know, many of them, uh, it's clear they, they when they went to Alcapulco in 2016 and 2017, it's because of the boom in, in Bitcoin value. And so cryptocurrency is both a facilitator of these projects. It, it enriched a lot of people who didn't have at least that extreme of wealth prior. Uh, but then it's also the language, right, of blockchain and transparency and circumventing the state uh, and and, and so forth, currencies that allow you to sort of get out of uh, fiat currency and state control and so forth. So it's very much uh, a part of this uh, in many respects. I mean, one of the things the Seasteaders did, they've tried over and over and over again to have success and they don't have success. Uh, but then when they don't have success, they need to come up with another way to keep people interested and to keep people participating and investing and believing in the idea. And of course, one of the things they did when their first sort of round of projects fell apart in Tahiti is they issued a cryptocurrency, Varion, and tried to get people to, to, to buy into <coughs> it and, and, and people didn't, right? So there's a lot of this sort of initial coin offering uh, kind of stuff that's also meant to, you know, it dovetails with this. You're very right. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a fascinating uh, history that uh, feels like it's just going to keep going until they, <laughs> I don't know what happens. Uh, Raymond Crabb, uh, professor of history at Cornell University. The book is Adventure Capitalism, History of Libertarian Exit from the Era of Decolonization to the Digital Age. We'll put a link to that at majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. All right, folks, going to head into the uh, the fun half of the program, uh, wherein we will have uh, fun mm -hmm. and um, 
we will we will probably continue to uh, 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 gently chide uh, libertarians. Um, and say say a libertarian has been listening to this interview. Call in, call preferably in. Yes. Uh, you know, just like make it known who you are at the start of the at the start of the phone. from your undisclosed exit location. Yeah, That's right. Right. <laughs> uh, no, Wow. Uh, it is, I, 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 it, it's just fascinating to me. It, it really is amazing because it always just, it, le it all leads to the exact same dead end. I, it, um, it's all, it just seems so much, bo again, like the concept that, you know, all of these wealthy libertarian types like Teal, they have everything they could possibly want, but it's just an ego driven project. It's just, it's just to prove that they were right. Right. In you know when they were when they were in junior in college they were right. It's so, they're and such I'm going dorks. to dedicate the rest of my life to proving it. You know, I, I it's was revenge of the nerds, but except like you know, I, honestly, I, I I I I had these like little tchotchkes, you know, uh, in, in in that I was gonna throw out, but they're like little I don't know, like little uh, cool little little clips or something like that, and I yeah. gave them to Saul. And he's like, how do you know, like, like, how do you have all this cool stuff? And it's, it's really, and it's like, well, I'm like, let me explain what, something. Are they like you. action figures? Or? No, they're just like, I don't know, like, you know, like even like a, like a, 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 a carbiner, you know, like a, you know, a carabiner, like just okay. stuff like that. And uh, he's like, how do you have all this cool stuff? And I said, I'm going to tell you a little secret. The stuff that a nine-year-old boy finds is cool is exactly what a 10 year old boy thinks is cool. Mm -hmm. And exactly what 11, 12, 13, 14, all the way up past my age thinks is cool. Like we just like, we're just, we get to nine, we decide what's cool and that's what's cool <laughs> for the rest of our lives. And like these guys just are that, but, and I do mean guys, they are just that, except for they just stumbled on an idea they thought was cool as a junior in college when they were getting high. And they're just like, this is it. And I'm going to prove my whole life is dedicated to proving that uh, those jerks who sat in the, the you know, the, like, like next to me raising their hand talking about how ridiculous it was, they were wrong. And that's basically what's going on here. I mean, it also dovetails with like t social isolationism as well, right? Like if they... F they were they were committed to this kind of cool idea in college that also validated the fact that they didn't have any friends, <laughs> right? And then they get then they take that onto the you know uh, the the nation state level, I guess. Do you guys remember the Seinfeld episode where um, Jerry and George keep hanging out with that woman who has that really amazing toy collection? Yeah, and the, they, the dolls on her bed. Yeah, and, and they like feed her turkey and wine, so she'll like fall asleep, so they can just play with the toys in her and like the, the huge oh, no, I don't action figure one. collection she has. <laughs> oh, it's like a weird episode, <laughs> but, but I was like, that's like Peter Thiel and like <laughs> Blake Masters and J.D. Vance, <laughs> like still trying to push this stuff forward, just like, yeah. uh, but by themselves, basically. <laughs> Val Shell asks, has a female libertarian ever called in? I, I, I feel like maybe we had one. Yeah, I'm pretty she sure before. She was not like, then she sort of like by the end was like, well, I'm not really a libertarian. I'm not sure exactly. But, but anyways, uh, call in any libertarians out there willing to hear your side of the story. <coughs> Don't forget, it's your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, justcoffee.coop. Fair trade, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. Get 10% off. You can get the Majority Report blend. They're a co-op in Madison. They have, they're the longest-running advertiser on this program. Actually, they predate this program. Wow. They, they, were, they were the first advertisers that, that Marin and I had on Break Room Live back in 2008. They're also the ones who tipped me off to uh, Mike Cernovich sending fake letters to... Uh, uh, our advertisers claiming that th there, there was some organization uh, uh, like, a, like a, a pedophile uh, mm. survivor organization that uh, wasn't going to babies because of my joke slamming uh, uh, Roman Polanski rape apologist. Uh, so, so they're real ones. They're great, a great company and great coffee. So yeah. check it out. Justcoffee.coop. C-O-O-P. That's the way that they do that um your favorite sports team mm. playing the sports ball uh won oh 
Kowalski. Yeah, wait a second. Yeah. Come on. Thank you, Kowalski. I'm sorry. We have we, to... we opened them really. We opened them. We couldn't, we opened we couldn't them them help ourselves. These are holiday presents. I you know. guys are opening them in the, like, <laughs> the first week in November. I know. It was like Halloween. Isn't like, that... come on. This is so cool. And um, oh, we needed this. Super cool. I mean, we have a we have a Matt and I took a photo because Kowalski also made it. Uh, got him a basketball with left his best on and it left and, reckoning and logo, left reckoning as well as a few it. hockey pucks too. Oh yeah. Yeah. Very they're awesome. We will post that photo. Somewhere. I have not opened mine Sam because been a... it's not a uh, holiday yet. Sam was a good boy and didn't open his presents. <laughs> um, I'm waiting. I want to play around with this, but we shouldn't do it in the office. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> but, but thank you, Kowalski. They're awesome, awesome. So stuff, so cool, and um, yeah, I really appreciate it. So thank you so much, Kowalski. But on ESPN today, the Giants are six and one. I feel like it's just shocking every time I say it. We'll be talking about that. Plus, a little World Series preview we'll do, um, as well as recapping the the the, few, the last few games in the NBA. The Lakers are uh, an embarrassment, and it's been fun to kind of watch them implode. In my opinion, we'll talk about that <laughs> as well as um our brady and aaron Rodgers both washed uh check us out youtube.com slash esvn show where we'll be having our ot uh thursday episodes streaming on there from here on out but uh this episode at least will be on the majority report channel at 4 p.m so check us out there oh uh <clears throat> matt's not here he's flying back from the Super group um, uh, show out in L.A. Uh, give them a revolution. Yeah, Matt, D uh, David Griscom, Jason Miles, Ben Burgess, Anna Kasparian, Nando Vila. I know. Have, have they posted All the stars. video yet? Can I got to ask Matt because he said he wasn't sure if they were able to stream, but I have to imagine they recorded it. I can't believe it. How could they, they not record it? Yeah, so we'll definitely get some more intel on that when Matt's back in the office. But Also, uh, check out Left Reckoning. Uh, quick break. Then to the fun half, 646-257-3920. If you are a libertarian, the uh, the phone, that is our special libertarian line. Yes. 646-257-3920. Uh, and we will see you uh, there. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? What, who sent us this? Anarchy. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back. And the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, back. Snowflakes says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar, what a, whoa, no. what a fucking nightmare. What a fucking nightmare. Can we bring back DJ Danner? Yeah, or a couple of them, just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. See white people doing drugs that look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Uh, 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 oh. Snowflake says what? 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 A hell of a lot of bank. Okay, I'm making stupid money. Hell of, hell, hell, <laughs> hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> a hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> All lives matter. <laughs> Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are back, 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 back. When you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on. Fuck em. Fuck em. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday. My birthday. 
Happy birthday to me, Jew boy. I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. Alpha males are black, black. Africans are back, back. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> what? Come on. What? 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 Come on. Really? Someone needs to pay the price of blasphemy around here. I, 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 I am a total pussy, 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 pussy. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. It is the fun half of the uh, program, um, wherein we will take your phone calls and read some of your IMs. The phone lines are now officially open. Uh, Rody 